Let's get to work. It's a good, it's a good lecture, but it's a busy lecture. There's a lot of stuff to it. So we're gonna try and cram an entire field of study into one lecture. Yeah, cliff notes. And we're gonna start by reviewing what we ended with the other day, which is basically we're just gonna look at and how, where we talked about functional groups and how functional groups in organic chemistry are just a series of atoms, sometimes just a single atom, um, that have certain properties that allow us to classify entire groups of molecules. So we talked about alkenes versus alkynes, right? The double bonds versus the triple bonds, how that changes it from being from an alkane. Alkenes and alkynes both react in a similar way to each other, but a little bit different. Um, and that's enough that we we kind of we don't want to have a list of properties in every single organic molecule because that gets me way too much for any person to memorize. There's just too many possible molecules out there. So functional groups are what allow us to sort of classify them just the same way. You, it's almost like a taxonomy, um, like in biology, where you would say, like, okay, all mammals have these properties. Functional groups in organic chemistry allow us to do the same thing at the molecular level. So we can say, okay, all alkenes have these properties. Um, and so alcohol, alcohol is one of the most common functional groups. And so we're just going to talk about these properties. These every functional group that we're going to talk about, we can go into into depth about some of these same properties. Um, and so an alcohol is just anything that has an OH group. You have um, a carbon, a carbon attached to an oxygen attached to a hydrogen. That oxygen has a formal charge of uh, zero because it has two bonds and two lone pairs. So it's a stable oxygen. And so alcohol is just anytime you've got this OH group, which a lot of times if we have like as a placeholder, you want to say like attached to any other carbon, we'll just put an R. R in organic chemistry just means some carbons. Could be one carbon, could be a whole string of carbons, doesn't matter. This group right here is an alcohol. And so if that's the case, the simplest alcohol we can have other than the people making chemistry means that claim that water is the simplest alcohol you can have, which they're not wrong, but they're wrong. Um, the simplest alcohol you can have be one carbon. So is that a polar molecule? What's our criteria for polarity? Asymmetry. Asymmetry and? Electronegativity difference. Electronegativity difference, polar bonds, right? Do we have both of those here? Yeah, we definitely have asymmetry because this whole molecule is not even, evenly distributed. You have one electronegative piece of the molecule and then everything else is sort of, you know, it's electrons are sort of up for the taking by the oxygen because oxygen is so much more electronegative. Um, so we have asymmetry and we have polar bonds. So and in theory, all alcohols are gonna be polar molecules by our original criteria. Now in organic chemistry, we kind of adapt our criteria and say, okay, well, yeah, it's technically polar, but we kind of define polarity in organic chemistry based on does it dissolve in water or not? If it dissolves in water, it's a polar molecule. If it doesn't, it's non-polar. And that's not to say that a nonpolar molecule doesn't have some polar pieces to it. It just means that overall, it's got a lot more of the molecule that's nonpolar than polar. We'll talk about that in more detail here, but this is just a, a good figure to look at why, we, why polar molecules behave so differently. Because this is a map of the electron density around the, the atom. And basically, the blues mean it's low on electron density, which means partial positives. And red is high on electron density, so partial negatives. And so very clearly, this is the same molecule here that you can see the carbon, the oxygen, 
there's the hydrogen attached to the oxygen. And then you've got some of the other hydrogens here. You can very clearly see you've got different, a partial positive and a partial negative here when you look at the electron density. Um, and so if it's polar, would we expect it to dissolve in water? Yes. What would we expect about it as a boiling point compared to other molecules? Low, sorry, compared, compared to water, would we expect it to be higher or lower? Lower. Why? It is lower. The group that just finished boiling off their methanol in lab this morning isn't here, right? And asked them where well, the methanol boils off at our altitude, but it's at about at about seventy five Celsius um, at our altitude. Because water can make remember that this right here, that's what makes it alcohol, but that's also what allows it to make hydrogen bonds, right? And hydrogen bonds are stronger intermolecular force than regular polar bonds. Water has even more ability to make hydrogen bonds because it has two of those OH bonds. But it's going to be a higher boiling point than something like ethane. Ethane, CH2, CH, or CH3, CH3, is the same size, relatively speaking, same number of electrons, just about, as methanol here. But because it's lacking that oxygen, because it's lacking the alcohol group, it's completely nonpolar. It doesn't have any polar bonds. So ethane boils at probably about minus 170 Celsius versus 70 Celsius. So there's a difference of 240 Celsius in their, in their boiling points, and that's entirely due to the alcohol group. Right, because this one only has those van der Waals forces, the dispersion forces, versus being able to make the hydrogen bonds. Um, what other physical properties does that, or what else does that tell us about? Who remembers their intermolecular forces? We talk about boiling point, what other intermolecular, or what other properties are sort of controlled by intermolecular forces? I give you, it mostly has to do with um, liquids. What properties do liquids have? Well, vapor pressure, viscosity, density. You could probably tie that back to electronegativity at some level. But yeah, the more pull, the stronger the intermolecular forces, the tighter the molecules are pulled in together usually. So you know, a lot of times density as well. Um, but yeah, so all of those things, like it's not going to be as viscous as water, but it's going to be more viscous than, say, um, you know, something that is completely non-polar, um, that is the same same size, even if they're both liquids. Um, like think about gasoline. If you've ever gotten gasoline on your hands, it's super like oily feeling, right? And then it evaporates really quickly, but you still have that sort of like oily residue on your fingers. You don't get that from methanol. In fact, you can use methanol to rinse that oily residue off of your hands. Non-polar solvents work really well at carrying away oils in a lot of biological molecules. A lot of biological molecules are non-polar by this metric that we're going to talk about right now. Um, so alcohols have higher boiling points than hydrocarbons of the same size, and up to a point, they're what's called miscible with water. Miscible, in the chemistry sense, just means um, just means that there's basically no limit to its solubility. They're infinitely soluble in water, which sounds also sounds like how do we usually measure solubility? How many grams can dissolve per 100 milliliters or something like that, right? So how can you have infinitely soluble? Basically, you can add so much methanol or ethanol to water that it stops being water or alcohol dissolved in water and starts being water dissolved in alcohol. 
So basically, no matter sugar, sugar or you tell people are like, oh, you want some coffee with that sugar or something? Right. So sugar is not infinite, it's not miscible with water. It'll dissolve in both water, but you can't add so much sugar at room temperature that you can't have more sugar than water. The best you can do is if you make a true syrup, but then you're 50 50 in terms of in terms of uh, mass and volume. Um, but you can't keep going past that. Then it saturates it saturates out and you get precipitation forming, right? With alcohols, the definition of miscible is that you can, and that we see this all the time with drinking alcohol, right? Vodka is 40% alcohol by volume, but you, you can keep going past that. If you go past 100 proof, then you've got more alcohol than water. And all of a sudden it's water dissolved in alcohol instead of the other way around. Um, <laughs> as you start getting bigger molecules, I should also take this opportunity to point out that, yes, they're all called alcohols, but very, very few of them are actually anything but pure poison to the human body. Um, the only small alcohol that you can ingest without it just immediately killing you is ethanol. Um, and that one still will kill you. It just does it on a time scale of decades rather than um rather than minutes usually well, what alcohol is so wood alcohol is a mixture of methanol and ethanol and depending on what the ratio is and how it was treated when it was originally fermented is part of how that works um but it's also why cheap cheap booze is really really bad for you and will give you a worse headache because they don't do as good a job filtering out the methanol is there a lot of uh alcohol that just kind of comes about naturally um like like decaying fruit yeah on the tree sort of thing like how did we evolve to so most of the yeasts that produce alcohol uh naturally produce ethanol they produce others small amounts of other alcohols as well but that's why in general if you're drinking something that is it is uh, not distilled there might be some, some impurities in there. There might be some methanol that'll give you um, a hangover the next day. Um, but in general, you're pretty safe with that. When you start distilling things and condensed and concentrating it, that's when you really actually get to the dangerous levels of methanol. So if you didn't drink the hooch on like sourdough starter, that's like, is that's that alcohol? Probably, like it's probably about ethanol. Five to five to 10% alcohol by volume. That's about where most beers settle out, being in that range. A really hearty yeast can ferment up to about 18% alcohol, um, but even that's a stretch. But like the weakest distilled liquor is about 35%, so about twice as concentrated. Um, so that's why you have to be careful with that. And the cheapest stuff, they don't do as good a job removing the methanol from it because why would they do that? Because it's still packaging it and selling it as a fit. Whether, whether 50 milliliters of it is methanol or not, as long as their customers aren't dying and the FDA is not revoking their license or something like that, um, their job is to cut costs, which is by you know, middle of the road, they typically care more about taste. And so they typically do a better job of that. So mediocre and up alcohols are usually, I don't wanna say safe to drink because the Surgeon General says that no amount of alcohol is safe to drink. Um, however, you're not going to go blind overnight um, like you can sometimes be drinking like bathtub gin. Somebody that distilled that, they call it bathtub gin because of prohibition. They would actually do their distillation in front of you in a bathtub. Um, but anyway, um, <clears throat> we'll get back into some of the biochemistry of that in a little bit. Notice that this slide is not tech. I need to adjust the slide because it's it's not all alcohols are that are miscible with water. It's small alcohols are miscible with water. Basically, there comes a point as you start getting larger and larger molecules, as you get more and more carbons attached to your alcohol group, you wind up, if you look at this electron density map, there's a lot smaller portion of this molecule that's actually polar, right? And the way that, that these things work is basically in order for this to be soluble in water, it has to basically push a bunch of water molecules apart to make room for itself. 
and it has to be making enough favorable interactions to make up for the fact that it had to break those water molecules apart. Well, when it's a small molecule like this and we're making more favorable bonds, that's a pretty easy thing to do. But as you get larger and larger molecules, you get to the point where it's no longer miscible, where you wind up with still an alcohol, it's still technically a polar molecule, but it's not as soluble in water. And so there's sort of a, we just kind of, as a general rule of thumb, you have one alcohol group for every five carbons. That's going to be able to be mixed in water pretty well. You get anything larger than that, and you're going to get two layers forming. Um, and alcohols do continue to get larger and larger and larger. In fact, if you look at their naming, the naming of alcohols, basically we just drop the E at the end of our alkene or alkane and just put OL. So ethane becomes ethanol. Um, any molecule you can think of that has OL at the end of it is an alcohol. It might just have a bunch of other stuff as well. Can anybody think of any other alcohols? Isopropanol, rubbing alcohol. Isopropanol is an isopropyl group. In other words, There's also better named as 2-propanol, but yeah, isopropyl alcohol. Um, methanol is campfire stove fuel. What's that? Rohypnol. Um, tetrahydrocannabinol. Those are all OH groups on there, right? And so those are all technically alcohols, although they have other things going on as well, which is why they interact with the nervous system in such different ways. So that binds, that separate part, like binds with your nervous system then? Right. And, and we'll talk, when we get into biochemistry here in a, in a few slides, we'll spend more time talking about, about how that works. Um, but different molecules bind to different enzymes, different proteins in your body and in your brain and cause different processes to either happen faster or happen slower, which is why in pretty much every, every psychoactive substance out there, every medication that exists is based around those principles. So some of them we don't fully understand all of the cascades that happen. Um, tricyclic antidepressants like Prozac and things like that, we still don't fully know all of the processes that they affect, uh, but they're all gonna work the same way. Their molecular shape is gonna cause them to bind to certain proteins in a way that causes other processes to be either be stimulated or suppressed. Um, and so an OH group is a really common <coughs> one because it's part of the molecule that has a very distinct um, electron distribution. The electron density around an OH group allows it to interact in a very specific way with different proteins. And so if you took an alcohol and then a benzene ring and then another thing over here, maybe a nitrogen over there, it's going to fit almost like a key fits into a lock and, and be able to bind to different proteins in a way that causes that protein to act differently. But just for friends, um, if you're, you used Moldview at all yet, we use Moldview more in organic chemistry because we're looking up properties and structures and making structures all the time. So there's caffeine um, is the default that comes up when you, but you can type in anything that you want to look up. There's our tetrahydrocannabinol. And there's the OH group that gives it its OL on its name. And is that what connects to your It's going to be protein? part of it. Yeah. It's going to be really this whole thing. It's going to be this benzene ring here and the OH there and this oxygen there. Plus this, this whole three fused cyclic groups together means it's limited in what types of uh, enzyme sites it can bind to. Um, but yeah, a lot, of, a lot of molecules that have similar, a lot of um, uh, medications that will have similar shapes, benzene ring with something polar attached to it, and then some alkyl groups off to the side. Um, what was the other one? The 
road. No, actually, it's not, but that's because it has this fluorine. I believe the original compound, this was an OH group. So rohypnol was actually a different molecule first that they'd have. We'll talk about drug design a little bit as well if we have time we get there. But basically a lot of um, a lot of modern medicine and modern pharmaceutical research is here's this molecule that we know interacts with the nervous system in a certain way, but it has some negative properties. Um, the example that gets used all the time is cocaine being used in, as an anesthetic in the late 1800s. Yeah. A great painkiller. Fortunately, it also came along with all this central nervous system simulation and addiction issues and things like that. Um, and so they started from cocaine and they tweaked the structure and gave it to rats to see how the rats behaved. They still behave the same or exhibit the same addiction symptoms. Did it still have the painkilling properties? And that's, that's how any painkiller that ends in pain, K-A-I-N-E, uh, like Novocaine, like Procaine, like Benzocaine, those are all cocaine derivatives, where they started from the structure of cocaine and chopped it up until they got the properties they wanted. So it doesn't get you high and make you addicted anymore, but it still kills the pain like cocaine does. Lidocaine. Um, and so Rohypnol must have been, I thought it was going to have an OH or I would have looked it up. Um, I, but my guess is that fluorine used to be an OH group when they, um, on a different version of this molecule, and then they switched the OH group for a fluorine, um, and that's what got, gave you Rohypnol. But there's a ton of other alcohols out there um, that are not immediately deadly to ingest, but then again, you're also not ingesting them at the same levels that you ingest um, drinking alcohol. Shot of vodka. A shot of vodka has a whole bunch of moles. Compare that to the dosage of THC, which is measured in milligrams, right? Um, if you, if you, you know, straight up ingested, I don't know, a shot of vodka has 45 milliliters, it's 40%. So, you know, call it 20 milliliters of just straight pure THC. Like you'd be pretty messed up there too, right? Maybe not like dying, going on permanently, but um, that wouldn't be a, a good thing for your body. Um, it's not the high you want. Yeah. Psychosis. Uh, all right. So last topic on organic chemistry before we transition into more biochem um, is basically this this poster of functional groups. Um, basically, and I'm not going to test you on all of these, but but um, let's see. Basically, for the top two rows here are going to be fair game. And the way that I'm going to test you on this is base, is just going to be matching. I'm going to give you all the names in a word bank on the side, and then I'm going to give you five of these structures. And I'm just going to, I'm going to copy and paste them right out of this poster, so they're going to look identical, too. Top two rows. Uh, these are the most, I guess, and amines. Amines are important. Um, but basically, just like we had, we added alkenes, we started with alkanes, and then we said, okay, but then we had double bond, that's an alkene, and then we had triple bond, that's an alkyne. We had OH group to a bunch of carbons, that's an alcohol. All of these functional groups work the same way. And all these different R's represent is just some carbons, any amount of carbons. So if you have an OH group attached to a carbon, it's an alcohol. If you have an oxygen between two carbons, that's an ether. And ethers behave differently. They don't, ethers have much lower boiling points than alcohols of the same size because they don't make hydrogen bonds. Versus epoxides make this weird little three car or three-sided ring structure. If you've ever used epoxy before, an epoxy is just a big polymer that you make by starting from an epoxide and then you give it, you mix your two tubes together that starts the reaction and literally all of your individual pieces link together to make one giant molecule, which is why epoxies are pretty much, once they're set, they're set. There's nothing you can do with them because you've made one giant molecule in this shape and it keeps that shape and it stays as one giant molecule unless you physically break it apart by smashing it or something. Even that's kind of hard to do. Um, halogens, 
The other name is halo alkanes, and X is the generic form of a halogen. So halogen means fluoride, chloride, bromide, iodide. Column 17. All of these middle ones, these are what we call carbonyl groups, because they all have a carbon double bonded to an oxygen. A carbon double bonded to an oxygen is a carbonyl group, um, which we spell. <clears throat> Like that. So add that YL to carbon. And a carbonyl group is just anytime you've got a carbon oxygen double bond. But it turns out that if you have carbon oxygen double bonds, um, you have a carbon oxygen double bond in the middle of a carbon chain versus the end of a carbon chain. That's the only difference between an aldehyde and a ketone. Um, Anybody, I know a few of you have done some work with, with uh, woodworking and painting and finishing sort of stuff. Um, MEK, ring any bells? Zan, you remember using MEK before? You remember what it stands for? Methyl, no. methyl, ethyl ketone. Yeah, yeah. Um, you can't buy it in the in uh, California for the most part anymore because it's not great for the environment and it's really high. easy to blow yourself up with. Um, or you just the Kingsbury Great, the hardware store over there, they have a whole section on solvents that's like catered for all the contractors in California to go over to the Kingsbury Great and get their solvents. Um, methyl ethyl ketone is not, it's not the true name of it. That's just the old school common name. It's a methyl group and then a carbonyl and then a, so a methyl group looks like CH3 and a carbon double bonded to an oxygen, and then an ethyl group, CH2, CH3. Those really four carbons in a row is our longest continuous carbon chain. So its actual known name is butanone. But again, I'm not gonna test you on the nomenclature for all of these. In real organic chemistry, we add these one chapter at a time. Like, okay, here's our chapter on aldehydes and ketones. We're gonna learn how to name aldehydes and ketones. And then a week later, okay, here's our chapter on um, on carboxylic acids, we're going to learn how to name carboxylic acids. So we're not, or we're not. I very quickly want you to recognize them and know the names of the functional groups, which is why that's the way we're structuring it here. But then, as far as like actual nomenclature and properties, that's a much more gradual process to the point where by the end of the third quarter, we've covered this entire chart, as well as what reactions do they go through, how do you make them, what properties do they have. Um, what are they used for? All that kind of stuff. Um, the simplest ketone is actually one that everybody's heard of. And in fact, um, several groups were using it in lab today. Anything ended in own that we added, that we used in lab today? What was it? Acetone. Acetone's true. True name, it's IUPAC name is propanone. That's the smallest ketone that you can make, though, right? Because if you go any smaller than that, it's not at the in the middle of a carbon chain, it's at the end of a carbon chain, which makes it an aldehyde. The only difference between a ketone and an aldehyde is an aldehyde, that OH group is at the end of a carbon chain. So you get this group here, a carbon double bond to an oxygen attached to a hydrogen, goes through different reactions than if you put a carbon double bond to an oxygen in the middle of a carbon chain. Um, and then all of these other green ones, they're all really, really similar to each other. They look a little bit different, but in all of them, the carbon has the same oxidation state. So they all got lumped together as carboxylic acid derivatives. Um, but, and I think, All right, so here's the list. The ones that I'll actually, actually test you on are the ones that I pulled out separately on the next few slides. Um, so al the hydrocarbon ones are alkanes, alkenes, alkynes. Those are the ones I'll, also, I'll actually test you on naming them as well. Oxygen-based functional groups, the simple oxygen-based functional groups, so the alcohols we just talked about, ethers that are kind of like alcohols, but you've got oxygen between two carbons. Um, and that, that's, 
the, the one that you think of as ether, the ether, just the same way we call ethanol alcohol in everyday use because it's the only one that we typically gets used um, in for human consumption. Um, the ether that got used as an anesthetic in World War or in the Civil War um, was uh, is diethyl ether. So it's oxygen. So beer and welding ether, diethyl ether. Not the one that actually gets used very commonly anymore. Dimethyl ether, you can actually still buy over the counter. Um, those uh, those freeze your own warts off treatments, where you like, you know, has a little aerosol can. That aerosol can is just filled with dimethyl ether. Dimethyl ether, though, um, doesn't work as an anesthetic. Uh, it, you might pass out due to uh, lack of oxygen, but if you tried to huff it, nothing's going to happen. Um, and it just has a really, really low boiling point, so it's really useful for making things really cold. Then here's those those uh, carbonyl functional groups pulled out separately. Um, and this is not listing all of them. These are the three most important acid derivatives are carboxylic acid. Esters um, are kind of like ethers, except with a carbonyl group in the middle too. And amides, which if you've taken, um, if you've taken biochemistry, or right, cell bio before, how are amino acids linked together? Anybody remember what that type of bond is called? I'm, I'm gauging where I'm starting when we get to the biochem part. So I'm, I'm seeing a lot of blank faces. So we're starting from scratch when we get to the bio oh, section. Peptide bonds. Oh, peptide oh, bonds. Okay, I forgot bond. Peptide. Yeah, okay, I just didn't hear you. Sorry, Jerry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the chemical name for a peptide bond is actually an amide bond. We're actually making an amide. It's a carbonyl, a carbon oxygen double bond, then a nitrogen, then to another R group, the, to the next amino acid in the chain. Um, but it's basically a carboxylic acid reacting with an amine. So what an amino acid is, is you get a, and it might be drawing this backwards, it's been a long time since I taught biochem. Draw it in a neutral form, here's my eraser. So an amino acid always has this general shape, and they call it amino acid because you've got an amine group. Here's your amine group, the NH2 over here, on one carbon, and then attached to the same carbon is a carboxylic acid. That's a carboxylic acid group. So an amino acid is just an organic molecule that has two different functional groups, two or more has at least these two functional groups in the same relative places to each other. When you put them next to each other, um, you actually cause a reaction to happen where you take the amine from one uh, amino acid, reacts with the acid from a nearby carboxylic acid, and you make a bond that's way more stable. You make an amide that is effectively irreversible under physiological conditions. Amides don't break down very easily unless there's an enzyme going around chopping them up. Um, but there's an entire class of enzymes that are basically, the cell uses them say, to go around and constantly just be chopping up peptide bonds, chopping up proteins into smaller pieces so that they can use those, those raw amino acids again to make new proteins. So it's a little bit, a little bit like uh, the little brother who goes around all your Lego creations and destroys them, and then you build up new things from the pieces. Right? They, the Legos are stable on their own. They'll stay together unless something comes along and breaks them apart. But once that happens, you can build something new. A lot of um, of uh, biochemistry is basically just build a new protein out of amino acids and different proteins have different, I don't want to say functions because that implies design, uh, but they have different properties within the cell. 
So under the right stimuli, you get some, uh, you cause a protein that goes around and breaks down other proteins to be more active. And then that allows the cell to rebuild those proteins in different ways that are more useful to um, meeting the right stimuli. Sometimes it's hard to like specific, have that protein be specific though towards that one amino, like that certain group that you're wanting to like destroy or like, right, right? like when and you're trying to like viruses and stuff like in there. Yeah, and, and really, we really don't want any foreign proteins to still be active enzymes in our body. When we eat something, we want those proteins to be fully broken down before those amino acids are involved in, are uh, imported into our body. Because otherwise, who knows what they're going to do? It was, you know, you killed and ate a rabbit. You want actually want rabbit enzymes active in your body as a hunter gatherer. It's not really a very like that'd be really really playing with fire. So to speak, in terms of who knows what's going to happen if your own biochemistry changed based on what protein you ate. Um, and so basically our digestive system is designed around anything that goes through our digestive, any protein that comes through our digestive system doesn't actually get into our body until all those proteins are totally fully digested and broken down into individual amino acids. Because I'm not going to touch that one. <laughs> um, but so we haven't actually defined proteins yet. So let's talk about proteins in a little bit more detail. Um, so basically, when we start talking about proteins, we're going to start instead of looking at this level of zoom, zoomed in at individual atoms. Like, yeah, these can be a part of large molecules, but these functional groups are still we're still looking at individual atoms, right? Proteins and in biochemistry in general zooms us out a little one level. Think about clicking um, zoom out one time on Google Maps or something like that. We're still not looking at the entire organism, but we're definitely not looking at individual atoms anymore. Um, and this is a picture of, let's see, I believe this is. DNA polymerase. Um, it doesn't really matter what it is. What the point I'm trying to make with this is that all of these little ribbons you see curled up are amino acid chains, are these polypeptides um, that are all going to be made of those individual uh, amide groups, linking them together. And so every one, every one of these little twists and turns here is of several atoms, several carbon atoms in a row. So just the same way that when we when started looking at organic molecules, we pretty quickly stopped looking at the hydrogens and just looked at the skeletal structure, right? That that's one step zooming out. This is another step zooming out where we're looking at, there's probably a thousand atoms in this picture right here. We're not looking at individual atoms anymore because we're looking at what happens when those individual atoms interact in a way that wind up creating these somewhat structured shapes and how those structured shapes interact with each other. We could pick any part of this molecule and zoom in and see individual atoms and how they're interacting. It's still all going to be governed by intermolecular forces, partial positives being attracted to partial negatives um, and both charges and covalent bonds. All of that stuff still applies we're just looking at so many of them at once that we get new properties that emerge. These ribbons are called alpha helices. It's basically like, okay, if we've got 20 amino acids in a row and it's the same group of amino acids for the whole thing, they naturally coil up into this like ribbon, ribbon like shape. And so rather than draw every single atom in here, we just represent it with that ribbon shape. And same here, you can kind of see the DNA double helix. There's one strand going back and forth. Right, so we're not showing all the individual atoms in the DNA molecule either. And so biochemistry is really, all it really is is where you, when you get new properties emerging from existing small molecules. 
Um, we call that an emergent, uh, an emergent property. An emergent property means that if you take the sum of all of these other things happening all at once and you average them all out or you zoom out, it looks different than looking at any individual atom on its own. But it's still the result of all of those intermolecular forces and hydrogen bonds and nonpolar regions and things like that interacting. And if you look at all life on Earth, it all is made of the same basic pieces. And so, yeah, it might look like, like there's a wide range of life on Earth, and there is in a lot of ways. But at the same time, it's all based based around the same four fundamental types of molecules, one of which is proteins. Proteins, um, DNA and RNA, and lipids and carbohydrates. Everything on Earth, all life on Earth, is based around those four classes of molecules. And the way that we look different from one another, from different species and different um, orders in the in the kingdom of life, as they call it, um, are all just going to be based around those very small differences at the molecular level. Um, I like this figure just because it does really look at the um, the amount of genetic diversity. It's all based from the same the same pieces. And to use the Lego analogy again, it's like we had a hundred different types of Legos. How many different, if you had an infinite number of uh, 100 different types of Legos, there's really not a limit to how many different things you could build with that, right? 100 different types of Legos is enough to make a ton of different things. And so that's really the way that, that genetic diversity and biodiversity on Earth is all based around the same few pieces. Um, so this is a picture of what's called a phylogenetic tree which is basically looks at and tries to group similar atom or um, at love, I can't even say the word because I'm not a biologist, animals, <laughs> um, similar animals and plants and bacteria based on how similar they are genetically. So it's basically, it's also called tree of life, um, but whereas a lot of tree of life, traditionally taxonomy, um, taxonomy in biology was based on what things look like. The phylogenetic tree takes that and says, okay, well, let's look at it at the genetic level and we'll see how similar the information is to these two species, because that's actually a better metric for how closely related an animal is. Like, for instance, how many people know that, that uh, hyenas are actually in the feline family? They look like dogs, though, right? But genetically, they're just evolved cats. They're cats that evolved differently than lions, but they share a common ancestor with lions a lot more recently than common ancestor with dogs. And so that's the sort of thing that the phylogenetic tree looks at. So it tries to get rid of what does it look like and just looks at what is the genetic code for this organism and how similar is it to this related organism. Um, and if you look here, this is kind of broken up roughly into sections. So you've got protists right there, bacteria and archaea are over here. And this is, this is far from exhaustive. Um, plants are in this section here. Animals, uh, I don't know that one, but that was another label that was cut off. Um, but basically animals is everything here. And then this is all fungi. And like I said, this is far from exhaustive. We'll see how, how many things we're cutting out when I zoom in on where humans are here. Um, because, well, we can see the entire mammal kingdom um, is only about three lines here. So if we look, take that little section, the red box, and zoom in, you can see that there's writing around the outside, right? Zooming even further, we've got homo sapiens right here. Um, but basically, here to here. That's the basically this fork forward is all of the mammals that are on this chart. Everything else in the animal kingdom is not a mammal. Um, and it 
you look at the ones that are some of the ones that are most closely related to us apes are Rattus norvegicus, which is lab rats, white lab rats. Um, and mus musculus. Mus musculus is a mouse. Mouse means mus means mouse in Latin. What about like fruit flies? They're like pretty similar to fruit flies, right? Like they have the really, they have a really fast reproductive cycle, and but they're not that similar to us genetically. Um, and the the genetic similarities we share with fruit flies, we basically are similar, are going to work be the same as we have with any any animal period, uh, any multicellular form of life. But yeah, that was that just that whole section. Um, so there's a huge amount of biological diversity, but it's because all of the but all the chemicals are the same, which is why plants that develop this a specific um, a specific molecule that uses a signal molecule within the plant, if we take that plant and turn it into a medication, if that same molecule the plant just used to tell the other part of the plant it's time to bloom works on our nervous system and shuts down pain receptors, right? A lot of those similarities, a lot of similar shapes have very different purposes and very different uses, I should say, in different organisms, um, which is why a lot of drugs and medications are actually sourced from other living things, right? Like opium from, from poppies. It's a naturally occurring compound. It's not like the poppies are, current, are high all the time. Um, poppies naturally produce opium just as part of their reproductive cycle. Hormone. Right. right, it's exactly what it is. Yeah. Plant hormones can wind up being drugs or medication in other organisms. Same with like if you took our hormones and maybe put them in something else, someone like, like. Right, and wet dog medication is not the same as human medication. There's similar effects for some things. But if you try to take your cat painkiller and you try to get high with that, it's not going to work. Like different molecules behave differently because we have different nervous systems. Um, so this is just another view of the of the tree of life. This one is kind of interesting in that instead of just having where the genetic differences are, um, it actually looks at how far back chronologically. Um, the split occurred. And there's a lot of other views of, of the tree of life that have that look at some of these things. Um, this is not as high of a resolution picture as I thought it was. So I can't actually read a lot of this stuff. Um, but all of these things on the side, these are all geological time periods. And so you can and you can basically all the different colors, the green is going to be when um, plants split off from animals and actually before that even it's really when algae split off from other bacteria that eventually became eukaryotes and i believe that because plants are eukaryotes the mitochondria had to be incorporated earlier from an evolutionary perspective and so all life for the most part that wasn't a protist was a um, eukaryote and then some of those turned into algaes by incorporating chloroplasts um, from other microbes. <laughs> Not my kids. <laughs> um, and then you've got fungi. Fungi are actually more closely related to us than they are plants, which is kind of interesting. Most people don't think about that because they look kind of like plants, um, but they don't photosynthesize. So fungus, all the different species of fungus all split off from our genetic ancestors more recently than plants split off. Um, and so studying the biology and the chronology of when these mutations occurred and how they actually occurred is an entire subfield of biology called evolutionary biology. Um, and I can't recommend highly enough one of the, one of the best science um, educators for, for the average person reading or some, some science background is a guy named, as an evolutionary biologist named Richard Dawkins, um, who has a book called, the, um, he has two books on evolution called The Blind Clockmaker and Climbing Mount Improbable that are both really, really good looks at evolutionary biology in a way that makes it really easy to understand 
um, without having a full on biology background. It helps to have some science background because you get some of his examples a little bit better. Um, but just the average person off the street, if you have a high school education, can read his books and under understand what he's saying. He does a really good job of breaking it down. Um, yeah. Can you say a little bit about just how the they are able to date mutations? Is it carbon dating or is it something else? Um, so part of it is there's a reason they use the geologic time scales. A lot of it is they date the rocks that they find the fossils in. Um, because most of these things are too far into the past for carbon dating. Remember, carbon dating really only works until about 50,000 years ago. Almost all genetic mutations occurred in the millions of years ago. So it's way too far back for carbon dating to work, but we can look at them, and, and in some cases we can get like, um, like trace amounts of DNA from some of these, these systems, Jurassic Park style. Um, but for the most part, we're dating the rocks. Um, and then we can look, we can look at the contemporary species, the species that still exist, and date when they had had a um when they're their what's what's the term? Um most recent common ancestor occurred by looking at how many random genetic variations have occurred. And so it's basically fused statistics with biology um, and that's a field called genomics when you're starting to look at applying statistics to okay if we have if every 10 generations there's four random mutations in this specific part of the genome and these two species have a total of 2500 random mutations in the in between these the same areas okay, how much time has to have passed for the 2,500 random mutations to have accumulated in that area. So part of it is we don't even necessarily need a specific fossil of that common ancestor. We can guess what that common ancestor might look like, but we can date when that common ancestor was just by looking at current animals' genomes. Well, also, does someone like that look at, like, climate and like ice ages and formations of the earth, like the continents and stuff and determine. <laughs> I'm sure that there's a, a, a fair bit of overlap there, but I think a lot of times the evolutionary biologists, they're going to look at it at the ice ages in terms of, you no, know, in terms of like, they call that an evolutionary driver. Like why did woolly mammoths develop? Mm -hmm. Because it was an advantage for these large elephant like animals to have fur because they were living in really cold climates for a very extended period of time. There's right now, we would not expect African elephants to ever develop wool like a woolly mammoth because there's no evolutionary driver. There's no advantage for them to be able to do so. So, oh, you're, you're an elephant, you live in Africa and you have a fur coat. But that's how helpful is that when it comes to reproducing? Not very, right? Um, so they would look at things, the evolutionary biologists would look at things like that as, okay, what about the environment is influencing specific mutations to be more advantageous? Um, rather than looking at the, the ice age itself, they're looking at the effect of the ice age on the, the animals and plants. All right, let's take a break and then we're gonna talk about how how all this happens starting from the molecular level and working our way up. So let's come back at five after. But only be able to post when we're done with the lecture today, we'll be able to sit down and finalize what's going to be on that study when we see what how much we get through. I'm <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, just like the stuff that I put on the this part here. Yeah, the like, part right under the window that have me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just thinking of where the the least of them and the only stuff that you would already cover. Yeah, like other stuff, but I was like some other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like this procedure where I might talk a little bit about it in the methods. The methods. Right, so the first one you're talking about. I don't know if you read them at all, but mm -hmm. uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think you read them. They like that. Mm -hmm. I thought I was like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there a lab today, or is that just for people in the projects? Well, part of the process. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, you guys have all the information you need, right? Mm -hmm. So you're. Yeah. Um, well, I already talked to Rayo about that because the auto placed out. We can't really do that. Because at first there is no auto clue. That's you can still she we I talked to her about it. Yeah, she also said that she talked to Carl and she will have to boil it and then boil it with, with like bleach or something and then she couldn't with bleach. Yeah, she said she'd handle getting rid of the actual part of the affected request. This sounds like oh. interest for that. Yeah. It, it's because the autoclaves on a and we don't have a material yet. Yeah. I told her not to do it yet because I didn't know if we needed more pictures of it. I don't take pictures of them set up. I just took pictures of you guys doing things. But like we should take that's like uh, yeah. So I was like, I don't know, don't test them yet. I don't know, you like put bleach in them and then boil them and boil them. It's, it's to kill the stuff that we grew, basically. And then, it, I don't know. She talks, to Carl. Carl. she talks to Carl. She's like, how do I? How do I? Yeah, because I'll be It is a week ago. They're getting ready to move it, move it. but oh. then it's not going to be ready for like. I don't even think they set a date. They just started unhooking it, and now it's just sitting there. Yeah. Yeah, because we both thought we didn't need it anymore, and then we all remembered clean up, and we're like, oh well. No problem. Let's keep this. I need to do a lot of things. What? I'm going to like scan for this class. I need to save this before it goes away. Okay. 
Yeah, because I'm people and you can think the disregard. It's like no, because like that's the thing. What's the graph? It's sure. That's the only graph. No. Yeah. Six years you're trying to come up like the fifties and seventies. Please. But look at it. There's supposed to be one something to five weeks to come on surgery. We started we So past one, two, and another Or Yeah, I agree. I don't even know what doing here. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's an exact range. Yeah, it's not a range. No, Oh, but yeah, it's gonna happen up there. Yeah, I mean, I'm on that same point. I've got an 80. I've got an 80. No, yeah, I don't know. If I pull out with the B, I will be so happy after this next homework assignment. I should have just basically like an 80.5. But I need to get I mean I need to get at least an Honestly, I wish you would just give us the answer. If you were happy with your grade, you don't want to change the final. That's what that's what Bruce did with my friends how four class uh when it came time for the final, he was like, if anyone doesn't want to take the final, they're happy with their grade, they don't have like no one's going to get it. Uh, well, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that like, that will all have to be That fast class? No, my friend Wex. That would be nice, but you know, you know, I don't think it's not a thing. I thought it would be so nice. I'm really trying to get an empathy. You know, like, I'm on the other side. It's like a half day. Like, I didn't have the best. I don't feel like I'm in I'm doing them because they're still counting them. Maybe we could do them or maybe if I do both, so give me extra points. Yeah. All right. 
other homes. So let's talk about about what leads to the form the physical properties of molecules that lead to the formation of cells. So it turns out cells are really just a way to kind of separate inside from outside, which is actually one of the primary distinctions of, of what we consider life is that it has some way of separating itself from the environment that it's in. Something that is part of its environment is not necessarily alive. It can interact with the environments, but really what makes something on, on Earth alive by our standards is that it has a separation between self and the environment, um, which in, in cells, what we call a cell is really just a barrier between inside and outside, and that forms naturally, even without any other enzymes or molecules present, um, because because water is the primary solvent for everything on Earth. Water is the most common liquid on Earth. And so with water being the most common liquid on Earth, everything that was happening before life existed on Earth was happening in water. There was also air and there was also solid phases. The thing about solid phases is that solid phases, nothing really moves that much, right? Not very much can happen if everything is a solid because all the atoms are relatively locked in place. And gas phase, things can happen in the gas phase, but gas phases, all the molecules are so far apart that they don't actually interact with each other that much. For the most part, gases are almost entirely empty space. So liquid phase is really where the interesting chemistry happens in the absence of life. Um, and what happens is if you have mostly water, but you have some of these organic molecules as well, well, one of the properties of organic molecules, like we were talking about, is they have these, this sort of water, water loving is the phrase that's used. Hydrophilic is the Latin, Latin or Greek, I think Latin, uh, word that means water loving. A lot of these larger organic molecules that form naturally have this sort of polar region and then a nonpolar region. And that nonpolar region we call the hydrophobic region. Hydrophobic region naturally tries to avoid water because basically it can't make enough favorable interactions with the water molecules to push the water molecules apart. The hydrophilic region can make favorable interactions with the water molecules, so it can kind of like fit in with the water molecules. It can push apart two other water molecules and stick this little OH group in between them and still be about the same energy level. But this hydrophobic region tries to avoid water, which, okay, well, that, that helps explain that there's one alcohol group for every carbon, five carbons to be soluble. But what happens if you have a bunch of water and a bunch of these molecules that have both the hydrophilic and the hydrophobic part? And a molecule that has both of those pieces is called amphiphilic. Two L's? I always want to put two L's. It's not two L's. An amphiphilic molecule just means it has a hydrophobic piece and a hydrophilic piece. So part of the molecule is going to have favorable interactions with water and part of the molecule is not. And so what happens if you have a bunch of these amphiphilic molecules is they tend to arrange themselves in such a way that the, the hydrophilic piece is pointed towards water molecules and the hydrophobic pieces all sort of point towards each other. So this is just a cartoon rendering of, uh, of an amphiphilic molecule um, called a phospholipid. And these yellow pieces are charged. They actually have a positive, sorry, a negative charge on them. So they're going to interact with the water. No, it must be positive charge based on the way the water is drawn. Um, what that does is it creates this part, this little bubble inside the water, because all of this, this section in here is all hydrophobic. So basically it's keeping water molecules out. And the region around the outside has favorable interactions with the water molecules. So it allows it to be dissolved in the water 
that create these little pockets where the water molecules don't interact. And so this is actually what led to the first cell-like structures that we don't know exactly what they would look like. Um, and really the line between whether we say it's living or not gets a little bit fuzzy at this, this stage. Because this is one of basically the first one of those classifications of inside versus outside, part of the organism versus not part of the organism, was just these, they call them protocells. Proto just means early. These protocells were just like these little bubbles, and you had inside the bubble and outside the bubble. And what eventually started happening is other hydrophobic molecules started accumulating in, inside. And they started interacting with each other in, in predictable ways, and in ways that started to replicate that same structure. You had the, a chemical structure that basically caused other chemicals around it to take on the same shape. And so the earliest forms of life weren't really life. It was just basically these molecules interacting in a way that caused them to be replicated. And that happened because we had these little hydrophobic regions that were protected from the water. And a lot of these, this water around it was actually pretty, pretty nasty. It was probably pretty alkaline in the early, in the days before life. Um, water on Earth, if you've ever heard the term primordial soup, it's basically just a whole bunch of crap thrown together. It's mostly water, but a lot of basic components, a lot of other organic components, a lot of oxidate, oxidizing agents. Um, and so what this, what this area did was basically protect the molecules that were inside it from all of those nasty chemicals around. And so that allowed them to sort of react together in a way that wasn't influenced and just broken down into smaller pieces by the oxidizing agents around it. All right, so who remembers thermodynamics? A little bit. You remember that you studied it at one point at least? <laughs> um, the first law of thermodynamics is conservation of energy. Makes sense, right? Um, the second law of thermodynamics is that if you have any spontaneous chemical reaction happening, total entropy of the universe has to be increasing. What's entropy? Chaos. Chaos, disorder, number of ways you can arrange things. There's a lot of different ways you can define entropy, but it all comes down to how many ways you can arrange stuff, which is a, basically a worthier way of saying disorder. So if the, for any spontaneous chemical system or chemical reaction, the system entropy and the surroundings entropy summed up has to be greater than zero. You have to be increasing entropy of the universe for anything to happen. Well, these seem like they have less entropy. They're less disordered because we're kind of grouping our hydrophilic regions and our hydrophobic regions where we don't have even mixing. So why would, why would this happen spontaneously? Why would the system become less ordered? What must be true? The system is becoming less ordered, or sorry, more ordered. What must be happening to the surroundings? Less ordered. By more than the amount you increase the order here, right? So if we can spontaneously have complex molecules forming, we can have order happening spontaneously as long as the entropy of the surroundings is increasing by more, then we're decreasing the entropy locally. So the reason that I'm spending a significant amount of time on this is because the second law of thermodynamics gets, gets used as sort of a, a way to sort of hand wave away the fact that life could happen from, from just raw material. Um, well, order doesn't happen out of disorder spontaneously, therefore there must have been a creator. Again, and that's 
point I'm trying to make is that that argument is not based in understanding thermodynamics. People use the second law of thermodynamics to say that there must be a creator deity. That's not what the second law of thermodynamics actually says. Because Earth is not a closed system. There is something that's powering Earth, right? What is happening spontaneously that's powering everything on Earth? The sun. The sun. So the Earth is not a closed system. And the sun is increasing the entropy of the universe by far more than we are decreasing entropy locally. Right? So it's it's an, not a valid argument, is the point I'm trying to make when people say things like it's um, maybe I just spent too many too much time in debates with people that don't understand science when I went to church when I was younger. Um, but it's not a valid argument. And one of my pet peeves is when people make invalid arguments, arguments based out of ignorance. Of what that means there. So if somebody tries to say the second law of the there must be a, a, a creator God or creator, um, they don't understand their own opinions. <laughs> yeah. Okay, you, you've successfully proved that the sun exists by making that argument. But, but also, would you take into account like the core of the earth and how like the things like the electromagnetic like electromagnetic yeah, that slowly stops. Okay. Right. Well, the reason that Mars doesn't have an atmosphere <laughs> is because its geological activity is or cooled down much faster than ours, and it's an existing atmosphere <laughs> <by> the <laughs> solar system. Um. So there's there's other things happening. Our core is also cooling down. It's just cooling down a lot slower because it's a Earth is a much larger planet, and because we got smacked by what was the name of the protoplanet that became the Theia. moon eventually. Theia. Theia. Thank you. Um, that actually kind of restarted and warmed up the core of the Earth a whole bunch. So when we're um, looking at other planets that have like we're trying to find atmospheres. We kind of have to look for planets that started around the same time as us, or no? But because there's different things happening, different things in happening in different like, areas. There is, um, there is tidal activity with some of Jupiter's moons. Some of Jupiter's moons are close enough that there it's actually tidal activity that keeps the core of the of the moon melted, melted, um, even as the outside is frozen. Um, and that's just due to being close enough to a big enough planet. So there are a lot of other things you have to you have to look at. But a magnetic field is definitely something that is a positive, um, and is is means that there's also likely to be an atmosphere. Magnetic field will protect that um, the atmosphere from all of the cosmic radiation. All right. So. What happens when we have a whole bunch of these self-assembling particles at once? We start getting really, really, really big molecules. Instead of just looking at a couple kind of big molecules assembling together um, to make one larger structure, these are all still individual molecules. But if you allow them to sort of react with each other, if you allow, or if you allow a bunch of these molecules that are right next to each other to react to form covalent bonds, you wind up with really, really large molecules that we call macromolecules. And a macromolecule in biochemistry is basically anytime you can take individual components and wind up with them linking together to make something with, that has, you know, 100 atoms or 300 atoms or 300,000 atoms, all as part of one molecule. Um, and we see that all the time. You know, here's one tiny segment of DNA. And this section here, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve base pairs. I mean, look how many atoms that is. And that's twelve base pairs. Your the, the human genome has something in the billions of base pairs, and that's it's all break, broken down into only twenty or I guess uh, how many chromosomes do we have? Twenty six in haploid cells. Um, like, or is it 23? It's 23, 23 and me. Um, that's where their name comes from. Uh, it's 23 chromosomes. So picture billions of base pairs broken up into roughly into 23, roughly the same size sections. Each one of those molecules 
It's just huge compared to the scale that we've been dealing with, which is why we have to zoom out. Right? If you, even in something, this is a relatively small uh, protein. This is hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a pretty tiny protein by protein standards, and it's something like four times, it's something like 800 amino acids. Every amino acid has about <laughs> 10 atoms at least. And glycine has about 10 atoms, that's the smallest amino acid. So we're dealing with these molecules that are kind of at a whole different scale than we're used to dealing with. Um, we're not talking about one individual central atom anymore. We're not even talking about one like continuous carbon chain anymore. Can't even look, think about it that way anymore. It's just too big to individually count these. Um, and but it's because it's made up of a bunch of repeating elements. It's also what's called a polymer. A polymer just means that it's made up of a bunch of repeating units. Poly means more than one, and mer means piece. So a monomer is a single piece. If you take a whole bunch of monomers and put them together, you get a polymer. So in other words, a monomer is a Lego. A polymer is, I don't know, Avengers Tower, or <laughs> take your, your you know, Lego sculpture of choice. When you put them all together, you get a totally different property than the individual molecules, all right? And so all, these are the three largest classes of macromolecules. Proteins. In proteins, the, the monomer is are all amino acids. Ribonucleic acids or deoxyribonucleic acids. Um, basically, the genetic information is kept in either RNA or DNA, and the individual pieces are called bases or nitrogenous bases. And then the last one is carbohydrates. Um, every one of these little tiny pieces there is a glucose molecule. You take a whole bunch of glucose molecules and you link them together, you get these much larger things that might look like cellulose, might look like starch. This in particular is glycogen, which is an energy storage molecule. Um, but basically it, your monomer units for most of your carbohydrates are gonna be glucose atoms or glucose molecules. When you link them together in different ways, you get different types of macromolecules out of it. Um, the other key term that we talk a lot about in biochemistry is what's called the metabolite or the substrate, because a lot of these different, especially proteins, wind up catalyzing certain chemical reactions. They're, they basically latch onto a metabolite or a substrate and they hold on to it. And then they cause some certain chemical reaction to happen. Um, and so the proteins oftentimes are catalysts. They behave a little, the kinetics of catalysts are a little, a little different than just zero order, first order, second order, like we talked about before. Um, but most of the proteins and most of the enzymes in living systems work by basically having this whole big system where the goal is to basically grab one of these molecules and hold it in a certain shape until something else comes along and bumps into it. And that causes a reaction to happen, at which point it lets go. Um, if you look at hemoglobin here, that little red portion right there that's behind, let's see there, right there's one right there. This whole 800 atom 800 amino acid system um, is to transport four oxygen molecules. So a total of eight atoms. The whole thing is just a support system to transport four oxygen molecules. So all things considered, it's not really very efficient. But it's incredibly flexible because there's a lot of other molecules that can bind certain parts here that tweak things like the binding affinity. How well does it hold on to oxygen? So we might think, oh, hemoglobin's job is to transport oxygen. We, it better hold on to it really, really tightly, right? But what is the hemoglobin supposed to do once it gets to your extremities? 
right? let go of it. So we need hemoglobin needs to be able to bind to oxygen well, but not too well. And there's a lot of other factors. Having this whole giant framework hold on to four oxygen molecules means that there's a lot of other sort of like handles for stuff to grab onto. Turns out you change the pH a little bit. If you go from a pH of 7.8, which is the pH in your lungs, to a pH of 7.4, which is your, the pH in your extremities and your fingers, um, that changes the binding affinity. It lowers the binding affinity when you get to more acidic conditions, which is really, really effective at basically letting an inanimate object know it's time to let go of the oxygen. Because where would we expect I guess this is a big leap to make on your own, having not had much biochemistry yet. Um, what is our, what do our cells produce when they're breaking down glucose really quickly? Pruvic acid. acid. What's the end result though? Keep going. What's the end of the electron transport chain? When you're done breathing. ATP. ATP and CO2. What happens to CO2 when you dissolve it in water? What does it turn into? Carbonic acid. Carbonic acid. And carbonic acid lowers the pH. So basically the parts of your body that are burning the most sugar and making the most ATP are also going through oxygen the fastest, right? And producing the most CO2. So basically when your hemoglobin gets to the part of your body where your muscles are most in need of oxygen, the change in the pH basically forces the oxygen to drop. So it's a really, it's a really elegant system, despite the fact that it's not very efficient in terms of how many amino acids you need to transport four tiny oxygen atoms, but it's really, really flexible. And that's one of just a whole, there's a whole bunch of different signal molecules that go into triggering hemoglobin, letting go of oxygen or binding to it more tightly. When I took upper division biochemistry in undergrad, the, there's basically there's one biochemistry textbook that at least there was when I was in college in the early 2000s. Um, every single upper division biochemistry class in the textbook, 95% uh, of them all used the same textbook, which was biochemistry by Berg. Um, and it has an entire two chapters, probably 40 pages just on hemoglobin. Um, and hemoglobin is one of hundreds of proteins. You could actually develop similar chapters on to make any protein of your choice. And you could write at least 40 pages on how it works and how it works in the human body and how these different systems interact. Um, hemoglobin is just both a small protein and relatively well understood. So it gets used as a way to teach some of these concepts that get applied to all these other proteins as well. Turns out every single reaction that happens in the human body is an equilibrium reaction and every single equilibrium reaction in the human body is tied to every other reaction in the human body like seven degrees of separation except talking about chemical reactions and substrates every within seven steps you can say this pro this molecule over here is linked to that molecule over there in terms of their concentrations in i'm just guessing but seven steps or less seems reasonable Um, so here's a, the slide on macromolecules in general. So DNA is a macromolecule that's built up from, um, what they call nitrogenous bases. They call them nitrogenous bases because they wind up making all of these, um, interactions between the two, the bases are all based on nitrogens and oxygens. So hydrogen bonds, exactly. All your DNA strands are held together. The reason that they're double stranded is because you have these, these pairs that form favorable interactions between each other. And A's and T's form three hydrogen bonds, C's and G's form, I, have that, I do have that backwards. A's and T's form two hydrogen bonds, and C's and G's form three hydrogen bonds. And if you link all of these together with these phosphate linkages, you get one long molecule one macromolecule uh, made up of a bunch of smaller repeating units.
Right, so here's an example. One of the cool things about proteins, one of the reasons that proteins are so useful is when we're talking about, about uh, DNA and RNA, we really only have four different pieces we can use, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. And really, they're pretty effective at storing information, um, but all of these nitrogenous bases are roughly the same type of chemistry. They're all the same structures in general. They're, they're aromatic with some nitrogens and oxygens. They all have similar chemical properties. And so they all, all are gonna have similar solubilities and similar, um, similar shapes and sizes relative to each other. So if you're trying to build something, let's go back to the Lego analogy. If you're trying to build something with a really specific shape and you only have um, one type of Lego to work from, it's a lot harder to build that shape, right? Compared to if you had, say, 20 different shapes to work from. And so DNA that stores information that can be read by various enzymes in the cell. And those various enzymes can take the information in the DNA and turn it into a three-dimensional object by taking a bunch of amino acids and linking them together. So in our Lego analogy, DNA is the instruction manual and the actual finished product is the protein. And you need, you can write an instruction manual with just a bunch of flat pieces of paper, right? But to actually build a three-dimensional object with a bunch of flat pieces of paper would be really hard. So what we use instead is the amino acids and because the amino acids wind up having a bunch of different properties. There's 20 amino acids that all have their unique shapes and chemistry, and they all have different, and if you have a whole bunch of different shapes and polarities and charges, it makes it a lot easier to build a three-dimensional shape because you can substitute in one amino acid over here is going to change the shape of this structure. Um, and so the order of the amino acids is basically is what the DNA code codes for. Genetic code in, um, in sections of the genome that code for a, for a protein basically just say methionine, glycine, aspartate, glycine, aspartate, serine, valine, isoleucine, lysine, lysine. It's just a, a list of amino acids in order, in sequence. And when you take those amino acids and you make this molecule, link a methionine to a glycine to an aspartate and so on, you get a three-dimensional shape start to form on its own just by virtue of the fact that methionine has a certain shape and then glycine has a certain shape. And all of those put together start to form what's called secondary structure. And secondary structure is basically how the individual amino acids interact with each other once they're linked. And you start to see things like that alpha helix I mentioned earlier, where you wind up these things called beta pleated sheets. Beta pleated sheets are basically these flat structures that interact with each other. I'm sorry to get off topic again. When you're taking amino acids like lysine and stuff, what do those do? Like, do they try to like form into those or like why? So in general, if, unless you're vegetarian or vegan, you, don't, need to you don't really need to take individual amino acids as a supplement. If you're vegetarian or vegan, you can get all of your necessary amino acids in the right ratios by eating properly, but you have to have certain combinations of foods eaten together. For instance, if you eat rice with beans, that usually mimics similar. Yeah, you get the full um, the full spectrum of amino acids in a in a way that's close to the same ratio that other animals use. So if you're not getting the right proper ratio, would your chain not look Normal, like if you're not malnourished or so remember how I said all these reactions are equilibrium reactions. If what happens to Le Chatelier's principle, if you take away a reactant, you have a harder time making product, right? You start losing products. It's not truly because it's a catalyzed reaction, it's not a true equilibrium, it's a little bit more complicated than that. But basically, you wind up not being able to make the proteins as well, which is why if you're working out a lot or if you're tired. 
Um, if you're working out a lot or if you're burning lots of energy, staying up late, that kind of thing, you wind up needing to make lots of proteins. And if you don't have the right spectrum of protein of amino acids present, you can't make the proteins your body need, needs. You and in that case, quinoa. what? You gotta eat quinoa. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, when, and actually, if you look at most, um, a lot of cultures have figured out what are the right, right vegetarian um, rate ratios and what complements each other based on what was growing around as that culture was evolving in the first place, which is why so many cultures have some version of rice and beans. It might not be the same beans, it might be a different type of rice, but almost every culture in the world has a rice and beans dish, um, especially cultures where vegetarianism is really heavily prevalent. Um, so you, you wind up with that sort of, that sort of trial and error, They've, and your body does kind of influence what you're hungry for based on what you're missing sometimes. For most people, if you're craving something in particular, it's because your body is used to having that resource and doesn't have it right now, um, which is one of the reasons why it's thought that pregnant women get such weird cravings is because their body is going through a totally different phase of growth that it's never gone through before and needs like this nutrient over here, but also that nutrient over here. So you get peanut butter and pickles or something like that. Um, that it all comes back to making sure that you're getting the cells the right pieces that they need. And that goes beyond just amino acids. Um, if I go back here. So this hemoglobin molecule is mostly made up of amino acids, but these little, these green sections are not amino acids. We talk about heme groups when we talk about coordination compounds, right? Those heme groups are actually not amino acid based. So you you have to get those some other way, and so a lot of and sometimes your body can synthesize these themselves, but there are some organic pieces that our cells need that we can't synthesize ourselves. We call those vitamins. Basically, a vitamin is something your body needs for a specific protein or a specific process that it can't synthesize on its own. So you have to get those through your diet, um, and. You know, so vitamin C, all the B vitamins, vitamin K, vitamin A, omega-3 omega acids, those are all molecules that our body needs but can't make on its own. Um, and even to some extent, plants even have that. Plants can make almost everything they need themselves, but they still need nutrients in the soil, right? They still need the right form of nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium in the soil, or else they can't grow too, right? So it's all living things have that sort of interaction with their environment that way. Uh, let's see. So real quickly, since we're running out of time here, when you start putting together these pieces, basically every time you zoom out, you get another layer of protein structure. So the individual amino acids in what order they're in, it's called the primary structure. You zoom out, you start to see how those interactions work, how they start making these larger shapes. You zoom out again, you start to see shapes like this, where you say, okay, it's a bunch of alpha helices interacting with each other in a certain way that gives the whole thing this shape. And that's called tertiary structure. And if you take a bunch of these polypeptides that have an overall shape to them and then put them together into a larger structure, you get what's called quaternary structure or fourth level of structure. So fourth level of structure specifically is multiple polypeptides interacting together to make one cohesive unit. But up to this point, this is just, you take these amino acids in this order and you link them together. And then when you look at, zoom out and you look at, and these are the shapes that those individual amino acids make. And then you look at, and then those shapes interact with the shapes next to them to make this. Basically, all of this is key. You need all of this happening in order to get a functional enzyme or a functional protein at the end of it. Uh, because all an enzyme or protein really is, is a polypeptide folded up in a specific way that either catalyzes a reaction or serves some sort of structural purpose, like a cell wall. Um, 
And I think I showed this one before, but I linked it in here too, because there's actually an interactive version of this um, of this chart. Basically, every single one of these dots is a substrate, and every single line is an enzyme catalyzed reaction. So and this is just in a yeast cell. In a yeast cell, there are, you know, then this is even probably oversimplified. But there are this many different enzymes and substrates, and every single one is linked to every other enzyme. Some of them are linked really, really directly. Like this is this is glycolysis right here. So some of them are linked really, really closely. If you have extra glucose, then you stimulate this prop, this passage through Le Chatelier's, which then cascades and influences this one. And it then influences this one, and then influences this one, right? You kind of get one big, you increase any one of these concentrations. The Chatelier's principle says you're affecting everything else. You know, the further removed you go, the less, the smaller the effect is. But all of these are linked together, which is, you know, it turns out that living things are just kind of complicated, even if it's just a single celled organism. Um, and every single one of these needs its own. This must be a mammal because it has a urea cycle. Okay. Yeast doesn't have a ure urea cycle. Um, so probably it's a mammal. Anyway, that's beside the point. Um, the point is just that living things are really complicated, and all of the quad different quaternary structures interacting together and the reactions that they catalyze. When you put all of that together, you get a function, functional, a living cell. All right, last few concepts. Um, just because, let's see. Uh, then we start getting into genetic modification. Mm, we're going to skip, uh, we'll talk about this a little bit. Okay, here's the last topic. And we're just going to mention that these things exist and what their general purpose is. Basically, if you have more than one cell, you need some way in, in the same organism. If the cells are going to work together, there has to be some way of them communicating. Right? There's got to be some way of these cells telling the cell next to them, hey, we've got extra glucose right now. Go ahead and start making more ATP. Or, hey, we have really low glucose right now. We need to start stop making ATP and slow things down. You can't just re relate or uh, rely on Le Chatelier's principle because we basically we need to transmit this message faster than Le Chatelier's principle in individual cells do. Individual cells, Le Chatelier's principle is fine because everything is in one solution. Thing is, every single cell in a multicellular organism is its own solution because every single cell has a cell membrane, right? So they're interacting with each other, but they're all their separate solution. It would take forever for a message to get from my finger to my brain if it relied just on Le Chatelier's principle. So basically the endocrine system and the nervous system are ways of communicating information or sending stimuli from one part of the body to, the, to another. Um, and the endocrine system typically is slower because that is, is, uh, goes through the bloodstream. And it's made up of what are the what are the chemical messengers in the endocrine system? Who's the hormones? Thank you. So hormone is just a chemical messenger that goes through the bloodstream to signal something to the rest of the body. So typically regulated by different glands, the parts of the brain, and things like that. They all sort of work together to say, okay, here's the external stimulus. Here's the response the body needs to have. You know, liver cells, you start making extra of this enzyme. Kidneys, you can slow down on this. And all of that is communicated through the endocrine system. Anything that needs to go faster than that goes through a nervous system. So, and I guess it's not in humans, it's bloodstream based, but there's lots of similar systems. I don't know if they're called the endocrine system, but anything that lacks a circulatory system is going to have something similar, but it won't be using a, the bloodstream to move all those molecules around. So like trees might use xylem and phloem to transmit hormones from the roots to the, to the tree branches. 
And I, I don't, do you know if that's called an endocrine system in trees? I'm not sure. Um, no, it is not called the endocrine system. What do they call that? Um, um they don't, I, I think it's just hormones, plant hormones. Plant, plant hormones. hormones. Plant hormones, yeah. Uh, so there we go. Um, but yeah, they're, they're probably some because they like this file, just like the some, there's some stuff, name, right? Like it's basic. Um, we'll have to ask Sue when she gets back from her uh, from her break. Um, the other system in mammals is called the nervous system, and that the nervous system basically it's what it sounds like it's communication through nerves and it makes use of electrical signals. You basically generate electrical potential voltages by changing concentration of ions across the cell membrane. You have extra potassium ions and not enough sodium ions that triggers an electrical impulse. And that allows a nerve cell to transmit a message from one side to the other side, because it'll basically grab the extra sodium atoms on one side and release sodium atoms on the other side. And that winds up sending the signal from one side of the cell to the other side of the cell. And nerve cells are basically really elongated. They're not spheres like we think about cells being like <laughs> circular. Nerve cells are really stretched out so that they can communicate really fast from one end of the cell to the other. So it doesn't take as many cells transmitting that information. Um, and the what are the chemical messengers called in the nervous system? Acetylcholine is one of them. Oh, oh, oh. Neurotransmitters. Uh, is there any overlap between these two systems? Can a hormone be a neurotransmitter? Can a neurotransmitter be a hormone? Sometimes they follow some molecules are the same thing. There's some some drugs, some medications, some hormones that also influence the nervous system, which makes them neurotransmitters and makes them hormones. Um, and so it's not like this is two discrete systems. Like with all the rest of these, all of this is one giant system where everything interacts with everything else. I think if I still have it. This one. So here's the structure of some of the most common neurotransmitters. It'll be the last thing we talk about. Um, this, full disclosure, this is a figure that's five years old. It's already super out of date because, and it way oversimplifies things because it turns out every neurotransmitter is really, really complicated and affects so many different systems in the body that you can't really generalize to say, oh, depression is caused by a lack of serotonin. No, we know depression is linked to low serotonin levels, but we can't say one causes the other in which way that goes, because there are so many other systems that serotonin influences as well. Right, so this, this is a kind of a cool cartoony graphic, but at the same time, it's way oversimplifies, and neurologists would get super mad at me for even showing this, I'm sure. Um, but I really want to want to show it just because this is sort of the like baby steps level. We're trying to understand the nervous system and consciousness in, in humans. It's like, okay, well, we're starting to understand how adrenaline affects fight or flight, but it also affects feelings of well being, which is why you get some people that are quote unquote adrenaline junkies, right? People that, that enjoy taking risks have other factors in their brain chemistry that cause. Um, adrenaline to be a favorable thing to ha happen in your brain, but it also has these other effects, right? All of these systems are tied together. Um, and really, especially these ones in particular are called the monoamines. Uh, has anybody ever heard the ter on the, um, the term an MAOI? Anybody know what that stands for? Monoamine oxidase inhibitor. Monoamine oxidase inhibitor. Basically, MAOIs increase the levels of all four of these because the same enzyme is responsible for breaking down all four of these in your body naturally. And so they think the thinking is, okay, well, if low serotonin and low dopamine levels is tied to depression, if we just increase those levels, that should have some positive effects. And it does, it just messes with a whole bunch of other stuff too, right? So like anytime you start getting into psychiatry and neurology, it's hugely complicated system, but it's also really, really cool. Um, and we're starting as a species to understand some little bits of it. Um, if you want to, if you want to ask me where I think the biggest 
advances in biology are going to be in the next 40 years? Neurology. There's huge, huge funding for it and huge, huge advances to be made because we understand almost nothing. All right. Um, keep an eye out later this afternoon. I'll send out a, uh, a study sheet, a study guide. But basically, the test is just going to be a lot of vocab, a lot of general concepts, like explain what secondary structure of proteins means. Um, and that's probably a little more, more like, how does the primary structure affect the overall table that we can use to explain some of that, those concepts? And what's a semiconductor versus an insulator? That level of sort of conceptual questions. All right. So some example problems. Okay. okay. Yeah.